Hello, I'm Kira with ECTV, and on today's show, Cheyenne will be interviewing Ventura County District Attorney Eric Nazarenko. Mr. Nazarenko is going to be telling us a little bit about being the District Attorney. Hi there, I'm Cheyenne Brody, and I'm here today with ECTV interviewing District, Ventura County District Attorney Eric Nazarenko. How are you doing today, sir? Thank I'm doing so great. On the show. My pleasure. Good to be with you, Cheyenne. Awesome. So let's begin then today with, I just want to ask you, what do you do as the district attorney? So as the district attorney, I administer a $67 million budget, and I'm responsible for over 300 employees. As the district attorney's office, we are the recipient of approximately 25,000 cases each and every year that come to us from the sheriff's department, as well as a number of police agencies for consideration of criminal charges. So as the DA, I help to secure funding for crime victims, for prosecutors, for victim advocates, and for our Bureau of Investigators. And I also hire individuals, set the priorities and policies of the office, and am the external face of the office of the district attorney. Wow, that's amazing, sir. What does a typical day look like for you? What, what does a week look like? What about a month? Or a year? I know I'm stacking oh, it up. Well, Cheyenne, first off, I want you and your uh, viewers to know there is no typical day. Uh, whatever your agenda looks like, it will change very rapidly by noon. It's a combination of meetings to go over key policy items. Are we going to charge this person or are we not? Are we executing this search warrant or are we not going to? And if we do execute it, at what time will a judge approve it? What are the steps we need to go through? There's a significant amount of public speaking that goes with each and every day, which I enjoy. You speak to secure funds, grants, additional monies for prosecutors. You also need time just to go through the daily news cycle. What are people saying? What are the letters to the editor? What do we need to know about criminal justice in 2023 that's relevant to the office of the district attorney? So each and every day is dynamic. It changes rapidly, and it's part of uh, why I enjoy this job so much. That's, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. What skills do you use most in the course of your work? Public speaking, which I just mentioned, is a core skill that I utilize fairly frequently, almost daily. You also need to be a decision maker. You have to make decisions. If you ponder and overanalyze, the decisions will just pile up and they'll be overwhelming. So you have to study, condense, distill, understand, weigh the different balances, and then ultimately make a decision. Are we hiring this person or are we not? Are we charging this individual or are we not? If we are charging them, what are the appropriate charges based upon the facts and the evidence? I can't do that with each and every one of those 25,000, but there are certain high profile, high stakes cases that I do get personally involved in. And then also, what am I going to say? Uh, for example, if you're speaking to a group of fifth graders versus a group of how perhaps veterans, they're going to be very different messages because what they're going to want to know about the office of the district attorney may be different. So you're also understanding your audience, what they want to know about what we do and who we are, and making sure that your remarks are appropriate, uh, focused on that group, and ultimately and hopefully well delivered. Sir, may I ask you a bit of a personal question? Is that I'm curious, did you have difficulty with public speaking? Because I'm someone who's struggled a little bit in public speaking. Do you have any tips, advice for people who've had that struggle? I do. It's a great question, Cheyenne. Practice, practice, practice. Whatever that looks like, whether it's in front of your high school, whether it's in an auditorium or a spiritual setting, whether it's to a group of individuals whom you're giving a tour to, wherever there is an opportunity in your high school career to engage in public speaking, do so. It's just like a sport. You know, you're an athlete, I'm an athlete. The more we do something, the more comfortable it will become, the less intimidated we will be, and also the 
theory of repetition is a powerful and compelling one. If you keep on doing it, you keep on doing it, the nerves dissipate, it becomes more routine, and it'll become part of who you are. So consistency really is what is wins out. Consistency. And I, and I started public speaking in high school. Um, I, I remember some very specific instances where I was asked to do public speaking, and I enjoyed it. Um, it to me, it's very much like being in a sports arena, whether it's a basketball game or, or on the soccer pitch. You know, there are people watching you. You have to perform. You have to be on your game. There's a certain expectation uh, that they set upon you. And I find it very rewarding because you can always use public speaking to change minds, to shape hearts, and really engage people in a way that you can do one-on-one, -on -one, but if you have a broader audience sometimes, someone will say, wow, I really heard what he was saying. It made a difference, and it's now changing my life course. Really connect with someone on a deeper level then. 100%. So, sir, I, we, we spoke a little bit about uh, the people you serve. As a district attorney, do you have clients necessarily in that sort of use of the word? And if, they are, if you do, who are they, and how does that work out? Great question. We do have clients, the people of the county of Ventura. So our clients are the 850,000 people in this great county, uh, and more specifically, victims of crime. When somebody is victimized, hurt, injured, it could be psychologically, physically, we want to make sure that there's some form of redress, that we do something to help them. Sometimes that's filing criminal charges. Other times it's getting them services like a temporary restraining order or a referral to a domestic violence shelter or help with their marital dissolution, child custody, civil legal issue. So there's a number of different ways we can help individuals. But, you know, what we do that is so meaningful to the public is we hold defenders accountable. If somebody does something wrong, there needs to be a consequence. But we also want to make sure that we're engaging in the best practices, what we know is good for uh, victims, what will help in terms of reducing recidivism or the recycling uh, occurrence of crime and just making this county among the safest. We were very delighted last week to learn that among the 16th largest counties in the state of California, we are the safest. Wow. And we have continued a 28-year decrease in both violent and property crimes in Ventura County in 2022. So these are good trends, but we have to work hard to keep them. Awesome. That's, that's such a uh, very empowering and encouraging statistic that thank you for sharing that. And um, I'm curious then, do you have any professional publications do you read? Because law, as, as we're, you said, it's precedent based, right? And we, we need to always be studying it and all the time. And I'm glad you asked that question. So in the legal profession, there's a publication called the daily journal, which is, is, is daily during the week. And that updates on cases, on legal developments. It's well read among the chiefs, among me as the DA, but also I read the Acorns, Simi, Camarillo, Thousand Oaks. I also read the Ventura County Star, Vita newspaper, the Ojai Valley Press. Um, I want to make sure that on a daily basis, I know what people are thinking, what they're saying, what's being reported, because oftentimes our office is in the news. So I'm a big believer in, you know, people say, I don't know what to talk about. Well, read the paper each and every day. And in that conversation, you will have something to plug into it because you're informed, you're knowledgeable, you know what's happening in Ojai, you're aware of what's happening in Ventura. I think with electronics, we're losing that a little bit. I just want to make sure that we continue to stay focused on the news cycle because it's an important watchdog, but also it's an important way to connect to others. Sir, you sound like an incredible reader. Uh, I would just, uh, just as a fun little question, how much do you read on, a, on average a day? Constantly. Yeah. Because, uh, as I mentioned before we started broadcasting, that period between 5 and 8, um, which is more reflection, I call it contemplation and reading time, it's memos, it's cases, not just newspaper publications, but 
people giving me items that I have to consider, understand, and then ultimately say, we're going to do X or we're going to do Y. So in each and every memo that's been given to me, there's some outcome that's expected, but I don't want to be hasty and knee jerk. I want to make sure that I've read and considered all different sides, which requires reading. It requires some level of patience. And, you know, these are big issues. I think the public deserves that. So then I, I would ask as someone who's looking into the legal system from an outsider perspective, hopefully a prospective participant one day, what, uh, it seems that almost your process, because you have to select cases, right? Because you mentioned you have thousands of them right. coming in today. It's almost, for me, looking at it, it seems like the writ of certiorari for Supreme Court. Do you have any, pro what's your process of that? Well, very astute question, Cheyenne. There are more cases than we can process in any given year. There is no way in a courthouse of you know, 33 judges and commissioners that we can accommodate 25,000 cases. So... Some will be uh, rejected because they don't fulfill the legal standard, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Others will be amended or modified, um, and others will go through a diversion process, meaning if somebody does certain steps, treatment or rehabilitation, then we'll never file to begin with. So you have to triage almost those cases. You know, what is murder? What is manslaughter? Uh, what is assault with a deadly weapon versus a simple battery? We fortunately have over 100 attorneys in this office, all of whom are prosecutors who are trained and skilled in making those decisions, but they're complex decisions. We have to operate with restraint. We have to operate with wisdom because ultimately when you charge somebody, you can change the direction of their life. So this is a power that we have to use modestly. Going on that tangent, then why why did you choose this particular field of law, in particular the criminal aspect, being a district attorney, because you deal primarily with criminal law, if I'm not mistaken, and that's um, like you said, it can be life changing your decision. So, how do you how do you deal with that as a person? You have to know who you are. Uh, I like a high degree of stress. That's just who I am. S some people they they don't like kind of conflict. They don't like sudden change. They want consistency. They want each and every day to look like the one before. That's not me. So you have to know who you are. What I love about this profession is it's fast paced, it's high stakes, and you get a result. Um, sometimes the law can go on for years. It just, you know, more interrogatories, more discovery. In our profession, we reach resolutions, and if we don't, we go to jury trials, and the jury either finds them guilty, acquits them, or they deadlock. So there's an outcome. And I also like the fact that this profession allows me to utilize public speaking because I tell people when they're looking for jobs in our office, you have to be a masterful storyteller who also understands the penal and the evidence codes. <laughs> you know, you combine the law with a gift of uh, storytelling. And it's one of the few areas left in the law where people stand before jurors and judges and try to persuade them. It seems like you have a real passion for this storytelling aspect of law. How, how, then, how did your interest in the, this area develop? Was it from a young age that you liked to tell stories and then led into the legal career somehow? I, I was a jock. <laughs> I was an athlete. Uh, and it wasn't until college I, I read a book called Helter Skelter, which was about the prosecution of Charles Manson, uh, a notorious and, and just vicious mastermind of a number of murders in the late 1960s. I remember I picked the book up on a Friday, and I had finished it by Sunday. And it was written by the L.A. County D.A. who prosecuted Charles Manson. And I read that book, and I said, I want to do that. Wow. And it was – so, you know, I wasn't one of these high school students that did – moot court. I wasn't necessarily thinking, even when I entered undergrad, uh, that I would pursue a DA. That book really turned a light bulb on, and it's been shining, hopefully, ever since. Wow. 
As a, as a, pres- a prospective student of college who's selecting a major right now, what major did you study, and do you have any you'd recommend for going into law? Well, I studied history, and I absolutely loved it. And I tell people who are interested in the law, history, English, poli-sci, you can't go wrong. Why do I say that? One, because history requires memorization of key dates and key facts. When was the Magna Carta signed? When was World War II? Uh, Who were the major generals involved? You know, you have to have retention and recall of very key facts, which you need in the law, especially if you're a trial attorney. The other thing, if you're a history major, you're constantly reading constantly reading. Yeah. And when you read, you expand your vocabulary and you also improve your ability to write because it's, it's derivative. You're taking what you've seen and you're kind of taking it on as your own. So I loved history. I focused on American history and I highly recommend it. So it's almost like the greatest story ever written, right? In some ways, I feel. Over and over again. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that's what's great about history. It's like, you know, I studied mostly early colonial, but I was equally interested in the story of, you know, post-World War II. Or I could equally be interested and was in the Watergate era. So there's no end. And I'm just talking about American history. I mean, what about the rest of the world? It's, it's, it's so complex and you're right. It never ends. Just great chapter after great chapter. hundred percent. As someone then who's looking into perhaps majoring in philosophy, what is your take on that? Because I've heard people go back and forth saying it's good for law, it's bad. Uh, I took philosophy classes. They were among my hardest. And I'll just be brutally honest with you. I don't see them necessarily as being good ingredients for law because they don't always arrive at a specific place. Mm-hmm. They like more the the discussion and the discernment. And in law, particularly criminal law, you have to be able to make decisions. I think philosophy is fantastic uh, to understand humanity and who we are, but I just remember my two philosophy classes. I took one as a freshman and one in my senior year, and uh, I was fidgety. <laughs> I, I just I, I felt restless because. I couldn't reach definitive, you know, it just, the, the, the spin cycle kept going. Essentially, because it breaks every rule it creates. Right? <laughs> Probably, yeah. And that's very hard for someone, uh, anyone really, especially those surrounding themselves with the law, the law profession, right? We're, bait, we're built on rules. Even in academia, we're that, all in rules. That, that's a great way to yeah. say it. Uh, and then, you know, what we do is we take rules and we apply them to a set of facts. Yes, sir. So, you know, here is the rule. Does it apply to this circumstance, this potential crime? So we call it in our profession the marriage of law with facts to determine criminal charges. And then on that point, um, how does precedent come into the matter? Oh, all the time. Yeah. Uh, because why are we reaching the decision we are? because it's been reached already before. But we also have to remember that the law is dynamic, it evolves. So you take into account precedent because precedent is your starting point, it's your guide path, but you also have to understand that the law also evolves. Why does it evolve? Because society has evolved. We talked about artificial intelligence uh, before we started this broadcast. That didn't exist uh, 15 years ago. You know. The ability, for example, in what we call child sexual abuse material cases, for somebody to manufacture an image. It's not even a real person that's being portrayed as part of this child sexual abuse material. Now we have to respond to that as criminal law prosecutors. How is that punished? Is it real or is it fake? You know, these are things that in in just... 10, 15 years ago, we weren't contending with that we have to now. So you can't always rely on precedent because that precedent didn't exist. Exactly. We're living in unprecedented times. We are. So then I have a bit of a controversial, but I I think it's very, this topic and question has come up a lot in my Mm -hmm. class, is that what is is your opinion on strict versus um, 
evolving const uh, constructionism within the Constitution, if that makes sense. The it, it does. I mean, yeah. my, my personal opinion has been that you have to see the Constitution as more of a living and breathing document, but nevertheless, one that's grounded in precedent and text. So I'm a little bit of a moderate in that sense. We have to look to stare decisis, what came before, but we also have to understand that the Constitution is somewhat elastic too because circumstances have changed. And I think the founding fathers, and they were all men, understood that this is going to be a document that will change uh, depending on the contemporary circumstances that uh, are applied to that Constitution. What, what work experience did you have prior to your current position? Because it seems you draw on a lot to bring, bring up these, um, these um, viewpoint and all your, your work. So where does, where does that all come from for you? Uh, well, this was my second career, so I didn't go to law school until I was in my 30s. And for my first 10 years, I had a career as a congressional aide. I also worked uh, on behalf of public school districts doing communications and community relations. So I knew by the time I was in law school, this is what I wanted to do. Um, but, you know, so much of who I am is a result of sports. I like competition. Uh, that's part of the reason I like being a prosecutor. Let's face it, there's a winner and there's a loser. And it's a competitive process, and I enjoy that. As our time draws to a close here, uh, Mr. Nasarenka, I would just like to say thank you so much for uh, being here with me and talking and uh, just telling me your experience and all these great insightful answers to many questions that I've had. And then before I end, though, I would like to just um, ask you, do you have anything else that I would love to have you back again on the show in the future? Please do, Cheyenne. Um, I'll just end with the following we talked about how things have changed. Just think about in 2023, some of the issues that the office of the district attorney deals with that we didn't even uh, really have an understanding of 10, 15 years ago, because it didn't necessarily exist. Fentanyl, you know, this deadly synthetic opioid, which uh, is unfortunately causing a number of accidental overdose deaths. It's exploding our caseloads. Uh, that is something that we have to adapt and address. And then you also think about ghost guns. You know, the ability of anybody to manufacture their own gun, which is unserialized and can be used uh, against others in crimes and offenses, and they can manufacture it with the right equipment in their own garage. So when you think about how complex this profession is, I just want your viewers to understand that it's complex because technology sometimes is moving faster than we are. We have to respond and adapt to it. We already talked about artificial intelligence. We will. Uh, this is a very uh, adaptive office that is committed to public safety. But I wanted to close with that thought because it, it's, it's worth kind of discussion in the future. How do modern prosecutor and their offices deal with emerging and new threats. I just mentioned a couple of them, but that is really a challenge for me. I look forward to taking on that challenge, but it's something that we will have to address, not just as prosecutors, but as a society, uh, because these are really uh, issues that go to the heart of how we feel safe and uh, you know, how we make sure that our families are as well. But I enjoyed it, and uh, I just want to say thank you to ECTV, and please invite me back. Most definitely. We look forward to you coming back on the show. Thank you yeah, so thank much, you. sir. This has been uh, ECTV. I am Cheyenne Barati. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching. I'm Kira, and I hope you enjoyed the show.